very clear. A flame depends upon three things. It depends upon the wick. It depends upon the the oil or the wax. And it depends upon the heat. Those three things must come, must come together. Heat, wax, wick. And it said when any one of those upadanas, fuel is another word for craving, for, for attachment. When any one of those fuels is taken away, when the wick is depleted, when the wax is exhausted, or when a wind takes the heat away, then the flame stops. It ceases. It nirodas ceases. So that's the same as the flame which you call you. Dependent upon things, when those causes are taken away, the flame stops. Nibbana. Poof, and you're gone. Someone says, well what's the meaning of life then? Many years ago, when I was a young monk, I heard from some friends in California, there was this little machine they were selling in the knick-knack shops in San Francisco. It became an item which you had to have on your coffee table as a conversation piece when your friends came. They described this little machine which was a fashion item in the best homes. It was a box, a metal box, a cube which was flat and plain on all sides except for a simple switch on one side. And of course, when your friends came around for coffee, they said, what's that? What does it do? And you were invited to flick the switch. When you flicked the switch, you could hear cogwheels inside this box. Things were moving. Soon a flap came out from the side and lifted up. And then a mechanical arm came around from the side, came to the front, turned off the switch and went back inside again. And it stopped. <laughs> it was a machine whose sole purpose was to turn itself off. And I thought, what a wonderful simile for life. <laughs> Do you understand that? No, you don't. <laughs> but that's all you're getting for tonight. Enlightenment. Now, that was a deep talk tonight. I told a few funny stories. But that's as deep as it gets. You see on self, you see the far shore. And then you go swimming for it, and then you're finished, you're ended. And say, what's the point? There was no one there to begin with. So there's no one there to end. What's the big deal? Any questions? <laughs> okay, question time now about enlightenment. Any questions? Have I bamboozled you? Yes, please. And upstairs, any questions, please? I can see you all there. Hi. Wave. Thank you. Nice to see you. They're waving up the top. Have any questions, please come to the microphone. Remember, all those people upstairs, you're closer to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so you must be the creme de la creme. Ajahn, this question is from the floor. What is Buddhist healing? So. What is Buddhist healing? Actually, I came from Ealing <laughs> in London. But Buddhist healing, with a H, you've got to be very careful when you speak to Londoners because sometimes they drop the H's. Uh, healing with a H, Buddhist healing, is where you use the power of the mind. It can be chanting, it can be metta, loving kindness. It can be your own power of the mind to heal yourself. Using the energy of mind to actually to ease some of the, the pain and sicknesses in the body. And Buddhists do a lot of healing. But the best healing is actually the mental healing. Again, this is an important part why it's good to give charity to monasteries. Because people say, no, let's give it to orphanages, to hospitals, say. And they need it more. And I say, no, you don't understand. What happened, which changed my understanding, was when I went to India on pilgrimage, as many of you have been to India on pilgrimage, part of the pilgrimage, we went to Benares, 
we went on this, this um, boat ride on the Ganges. I never do that again because there's nothing Buddhist there, but it, actually afterwards it was a very interesting experience. After landing, after the little boat ride at dawn, we walked through the back streets of Benares and as soon as we started walking, all these very poor lepers came out asking for money. These were real lepers with dirty wounds sleeping out on the streets as poor, as deprived, as uh, excluded as you can possibly get. And one of them came to me, they saw I was a Westerner and they came up, rupee, rupee, rupee. And I, being a very silly monk, turned around and said, I haven't got any money, I'm a monk. I said it in English, thinking that sort of destitute beggars could speak English. That's how stupid I was. And this guy just gave me a toothless smile and said, rupee, rupee, rupee. It was a waste of time trying to speak with him. So I thought, what could I do to this guy? Because I didn't have any rupees. Now, as a monk who doesn't keep any money. And I couldn't explain that to him. So all I did, I just put my arm around him. Just like as a Western, that sort of greeting of compassion. And I put my arm around him and gave him a smile. And he gave me this most beautiful, wonderful smile, which has stayed with me forever. And I thought afterwards, how on earth can a person in that situation smile like that? How can a leper, destitute, homeless, rejected from even other poor Indians, have such happiness inside of him? Because that's what that smile showed me. And I realized afterwards, when I got back to Perth, the suicide rate in Perth is far, far higher than the suicide rate in Benares. And I thought, why? Why is it in a rich city where people have got health care, they've got good schools, they've got social services, they've got opportunities, beautiful beaches, everything you could ever hope for, why in Perth do many people commit suicide where lepers are so happy? And I realized, especially with suicide, there is a type of sickness, a type of pain which even is a worse than leprosy. The pain which you can't stand. You can stand being a leper. There's some pain you can't stand. You have to kill yourself. That's a pain which you cannot see on the body. It's not marked with a limp or with a scar. It's not, I can't even see it with a fever. It's that invisible sickness that pain which is, can be in any one of you here and no one can notice it. Depression, fear, loneliness, mental pain. When I saw that I realized that it's the monasteries, the temples, places like this which can heal a pain which no other hospital can. We can take away such suffering when you hear the Dhamma which actually saves many, many lives. The thing in a hospital, you can see when people go in, you can see them sick. You can see them coming out healthy. In a temple, you can't see the sickness which they bring in here. You can't see the health which they take out. But don't think these places don't work. These places are huge hospitals for the mind. That's why it's good to support temples. As much as you support hospitals, even more, this is the hospital for the mind. And you know it works. Many people have told me, if they hadn't come and listened to Dharma, they'd be dead by now. So yeah, I don't know where we started on that question, but it's a nice place to finish. <laughs> In fact, uh, the questioner has got three so I'll read all and... Yeah, go on. Let's see which ones are good right. enough to answer. The first one is what is Buddhist healing. The next one is if a healing work requires one to pay, would you go for the healing session as a monk? Okay. Yeah, the next question. If a healer says that you have no common sense but cow sense, what do you do? Thank you. If I'm being a... <laughs> If, first of all, if healers ask for money, and if they say you have got no common sense, only cow sense, say that cows don't have money, moo off. <laughs> 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 no, 
Because know that sometimes that ah, I really think that you know healing should be done for free. Because I can't see why a person should make money out of other people's suffering. And I can't. So personally, anything which I give and do, you don't actually ask anything back in return. And sometimes, sometimes it's true. Sometimes don't, people don't give anything as well. I went to this funeral service just before I came here. This uh, Western man who died of cancer is only in his late 30s. His family were quite sort of distraught and I really helped them out. I gave really extra to them, really looked after them, gave a great sort of uh, funeral service for them. And then when they sort of came up to me afterwards and said, you know, how much do we have to pay? So it's all done by donation. You can give whatever you like. So they didn't give anything. <laughs> Westerners are like that sometimes. That, you know, if you don't give them an invoice, they'll never give you anything. <laughs> but never mind, it's always a good story. But like, if anyone demands payment, there always seems to be something wrong there, especially if it's a lot of money, just don't do that. You can get a far better service from monks like myself who don't charge at all. This is high quality, low price, <laughs> the best possible deal you can get. <laughs> but you know, sometimes, maybe just to cover costs, fair enough. But it's also, if they start saying you haven't got any common sense, you've only got cow sense, my goodness, and, and they want payment for that? <laughs> so like kind, good people, healers, they should have loving kindness. And sometimes they know how to speak to you. They usually speak with kindness, with gentleness. You get much more out of a person with kindness than you do with abuse. I don't abuse my monks and I get much more out of them by being kind, by encouraging. You try that with your husband. When you go home, say, oh dear husband, kind husband, nice husband. <laughs> well, you're such a wonderful husband. Now, would you mind if I get that nice dress in the shop? <laughs> yes, you get much more out of people when you're really sort of nice to them. That's what I found. Next question. Any question here? Yeah, go on. Anyone at the top there? Any questions up in heaven? No. Your, the upper story is called the heaven of the contented. <laughs> they are so contented up there. They don't ask questions. Yeah. Uh, Ajahn Brahm, I have three points that I want you to clarify. Oh my goodness. The first one relates to the various stages of enlightenment, starting with Sotapanna right down to uh, Arahat. Yeah. But the question actually relates to the first three stages. Mm -hmm. uh, it may appear to be a very rude, but I, I ask out of ignorance. Uh -huh. Something's uh, coming on. Are there any documentary evidence to support the teaching that Osotopana has a maximum of seven lives, then there is a once returner and a non returner? And are we just to follow this teaching out of pure faith through meditation? Okay. I'll answer that first question first. Thank you. And again, that the only way that you can understand, there is documentary evidence in the suttas and in the Tipitaka, but sometimes the people can't actually take that as absolute, because it's just what somebody else said, even though it's supposed to be the word of the Buddha, and I think it is the word of the Buddha, I've got great faith in those teachings. But nevertheless, people say, well, you know, might as well have faith in the Bible, or faith in some other document. The only faith which works is actually your own experience. And if you actually even get to being a stream winner, you will understand why that is true. The thing is that when we're so far away, we can't really understand exactly what it is and why it is. But I guarantee this, if you become a stream winner, especially if you under overcome this idea of like the will being the person in control of you, you understand this is a natural process. It's like a law of science, like a law of physics. You know, what goes up comes down. You can actually chart the course of a projectile in space. It goes according to natural laws. And you know, just the, the stars or the, you know, the planets, they can't just suddenly decide to change course. There's laws, cause and effect, understandable reasons why this happens. And if the understanding which will give you the clue to understanding why this happens is a full understanding of non-self and the way that will 
actually works. So you can't change this, it's a natural process. Once that self-delusion has been overcome, you cannot maintain craving anymore. It's like undermined. It's like you've got a car and the, the gas runs out. You can keep driving that car for a while, it's got its momentum, but you know if there's no more gas in the car, there's no way to fill it up, that car has to come to a stop. Seven blocks or one block is going to come to a stop. Would I be correct then to conclude from what you have just explained? You practice through faith, then you have to experience. Yeah. Then only the other things will fall in place. Correct, correct. yes. Thank you. Very now, good. The next uh, question relates to, or the next uh, clarification, I would say, yeah. relates to uh, the fact that I've observed over a number of times that you don't mention much about chanting. Any special reason for that? Okay. Now that chanting is quite useful as an adjunct, in other words, as a help, as a supporting condition. But really, the, the main path of Buddhism, again, sometimes people say, oh, it's vipassana, sometimes it's chanting. It's very good to go to the heart of the Buddha's teachings, the earliest Buddhist teachings, where everyone agrees on. The path of enlightenment is the Eightfold Path. So that's what we always try and teach, Eightfold Path, Eightfold Path, Eightfold Path. As I was saying yesterday, whether you're practicing Mahayana, Theravada, Vajrayana, the Bodhisattva path, Sila Samadhi Panya, the Eightfold Path is in there as well. This is what's common to all Buddhist traditions. So this is what you try and um, always focus on, which is, you know, right view, right intention, right speech, action, livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right letting go. So that's what you focus on. Chanting could be part of that, but it's, as it were, sort of not central to the path. You don't need to throw away your chanting. It's great to do chanting. But central part is your precepts, your meditation and your wisdom. Because sometimes people chant and they don't know what they're chanting. Because there was this case in Thailand some years ago. People were chanting the five precepts. And because if you go to a temple when other people were chanting the five precepts, everyone had to chant the five precepts, but hardly anyone was keeping them. <laughs> so they worked out a system because they thought, well, if I'm going to take the five precepts, but I'm lying, that's very bad karma. And the Thais were very scared of bad karma. So they got this system of how you can actually chant the five precepts without keeping them all. You'd see them with their hands up like this, but sometimes they'd have one finger down. <laughs> that meant they'd only keep four precepts. <laughs> they still chant them all, but that was almost like the fingers behind the back. You know, the one precept they weren't going to keep. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I found that out, I saw some people with two fingers down. <laughs> you even saw some people chanting with all their fingers down. <laughs> No, oh, crazy. So sometimes the chanting can be just like the, the ritual which hasn't got any meaning. And that means it doesn't work at all. It's better not done. But if you understand what you're chanting, how many people chant Om Mani Padme Hum but don't know a word what it means? It's important to find the meaning first of all. And then the chanting is meaningful. Yeah, go on. What is the meaning of the Om Mani Padme Hum? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, sh- I, I told that meaning last night, the jewel no, in, the, ha- in oh, the lotus, yeah. And that jewel is emptiness, you're the lotus. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes, lotus, please say again. The, the third point, <laughs> uh, the work of faith healers, is, is this some deva that has entered the physical body of the person mm-hmm. who performs faith healing. What are your comments on this? Okay, faith healing, there's many types of faith healing, but I think the one I said about yesterday, about that um, experiment which was done in the United States, which I think was last night I mentioned that, or was it this morning? This morning, okay, it was in question time. In, I forget the journal now, some journal, I think the Western Journal of Psychiatry I think it was called, 
It was in, anyway, December 1998. It was an experiment which was done in the U.S., in California, where a number of...